When Jesus died on Good Friday, his friends and followers experienced the end of the world as they had known it with a crushing defeat to all of their hopes and dreams, the upending of what they believed in, of who they believed in. In its place came fear and frustration, doubt and disappointment. For years, they had followed the Lord and been simply amazed by him. They were amazed by his poise and purpose and presence, his message and mission and miracles. They came to believe that he had been sent from God as the long-awaited Messiah and Savior who would change everything. All of this came to a wonderful kind of culmination on Palm Sunday as he rode in triumph through the streets of Jerusalem like a conquering hero. They came to believe that this was their moment when Jesus would be hailed as king and they would form his court. That's what they believed and they were wrong. All their hopes and dreams crushed on the cross. They couldn't believe what was happening. What do you do? What do you do when you can't believe what's happening? We're in the fourth week of our Easter series and the fourth week of the Easter season. As a church, we continue the celebration of the resurrection of the Lord, though this Easter feels quite different. We live in a very different, a very uncertain time. For sure, we feel fear and frustration in the face of doubt and disappointment, just like those friends and followers of Jesus on the very first Easter. We've been looking at the Easter story, beginning with the discovery of the empty tomb by Jesus' friends, Mary, Peter, and John, and the faith that this discovery inspired. Two weeks ago, we looked at the story of Thomas, another friend and follower of Jesus, but one who was much slower, much more reluctant to believe. Faith, we learned, is a gift. It's given by God, and we choose to believe or not. Peter and John, Mary and Thomas were just as incredulous of Jesus' resurrection as modern minds often are. They couldn't believe what was happening, but they didn't do nothing. They deliberately put themselves in a position to recognize what God was doing through this unbelievable situation. That disposes them to the gift of faith. And with faith, they find hope. Faith and hope, we said, always go together. That's the lesson we learned last Sunday from another Easter story from the Gospel of Luke. In that Easter story, Jesus revealed himself to his friends in a town called Emmaus. These friends had lost hope, and the risen Lord restores it. We talked about three degrees of hope. Casual hope, precious hope, and ultimate hope. And the exercise we looked at last week was making a list of the hopes that we're hoping for in and beyond this crisis. By the way, if you've missed any or all of this series, you can always catch up online. Just go to churchnativity.com slash messages. They're all there, and you can share messages with friends who might need to hear them. Today, I'd like to encourage you with another word of hope when it comes to a very specific hope, perhaps a hope that hasn't made your list yet. We'll take a look. We're looking at a passage from the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. Jesus, in this passage, is speaking to the Pharisees and the other religious leaders, as he often did. And in his speech, he uses an image that would have been quite commonplace, that would have been quite familiar to them, the image of a shepherd. He also describes a scene that they would have witnessed 
daily in their Mideastern community. Towards evening, shepherds would herd their sheep into an enclosure called a sheepfold, along with other shepherds' flocks. A sheepfold, a sheepfold was an enclosure with stone walls that protected the sheep from thieves and wild animals looking for prey at night. A guard would be stationed at the entrance to the gate to both protect the sheep and keep them in the fold. And then at dawn, the shepherds would return and call their flocks out of the sheepfold. Jesus said, whoever enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him. The sheep hear his voice as the shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Each shepherd had his own distinct call and the sheep knew the sound of their own shepherd's voice. They heard that voice every single day. So they'd become accustomed to it and they followed that voice. The sheep knew their shepherd and the shepherds knew their sheep. There are certain voices you know, you recognize, they bring comfort and security. As a child, perhaps, you recognize the voice of your parents, of course. Maybe you can recall a time as a child when you were separated from your parents at a supermarket or, or perhaps the mall. You were scared and frightened and alone. And then you heard the voice of your parent and you knew instantly it would be okay. Now it might be the voice of your spouse or a good friend. When you hear their voice, it brings gladness to your heart. Or it's the feeling of being at a party where you don't know anyone. You feel out of place until you hear the friendly greeting of, of someone you do know. They call out your name and hearing your name brings relief. It brings gladness to your heart. In fact, it said the sweetest sound you ever hear is the sound of your own name. I remember, and I'll never forget, being introduced to Pope John Paul when I was a student in Rome. And he so graciously greeted me by name. Hearing him use my name, it meant everything to me. Well, Jesus says he knows us by name. He knows us that well. He continues the analogy. When he has driven out all his own, he walks ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. The shepherd would lead them out of the sheepfold and off to the pastures that they would be grazing in for that day. Different days, they would rotate to different pastures to give the grasses time to grow back. Shepherds would walk ahead of the sheep and lead them to the right pasture. He would make sure they were on the right path to the right pasture. And with his staff, he would ward off potential predators that they might encounter along the way. He goes before them, leading them to exactly the best place for, for them where they could feed in peace and security. Did you know, did you know that the Lord walks ahead of you? Did you ever think about that? He knows the path that you're on, the direction that you should take. He knows the mistakes and missteps that you could make, as well as the threats and danger that you might encounter up ahead. He knows the very best place for you, the very best place for the health of your heart and soul and spirit. And he wants to lead you there. He wants to lead you into that future. But they will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they do not recognize the voice of the stranger. Sheep are simple creatures for sure. In fact, it can be a criticism to call people sheep as it suggests 
that they can't think for themselves, that they're gullible or easily misled. But actually, none of that is true of sheep. They're very adept at recognizing the voice of their shepherd and what his various calls are instructing them to do. And they cannot be misled by the voice of another. For sure, there are many voices in our lives. There are voices that are supportive and encouraging for the path that we're on, whether or not it's the right path for us. There are voices that are critical, whether or not we deserve the criticism. There are voices of wisdom and voices of folly, voices of good humor and good cheer, and voices of gloom and doom. And then, then there is that voice in our own head, a voice that can often be quite negative. Jesus goes on. A thief comes not only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came that they might ha have life and have it more abundantly. There are many voices in our lives. And depending upon how carefully we're listening to those voices, they're influencing us. They're leading us or misleading us. Misleading us or leading us to more successful living or self-defeating patterns of behavior, to life-affirming and enriching relationships or just abusive ones that are filled with distrust and discord, to hope and confidence in the future or just anxiety about it. The wrong voice can be like a thief robbing us of joy, like a thief stealing what is most valuable to us. The wrong voices in our lives can be destructive. They damage and destroy our future. Christ described himself as the good shepherd, the good shepherd who came that we might have life more abundantly, with abundant peace, abundant joy, abundant hope in the future. So, here's the one thing among all our hopes we can hold during this quarantine and beyond it. We can hope to hear the Lord as he goes before us into the future. And I'd like to offer three steps, three simple steps to help make that happen. Nothing terribly insightful or earth shattering, just three basic steps, exactly what you'd expect. Step one, turn down the noise. You need some space to listen to the Lord. You need some silence to listen to him. Maybe that's not a problem for you these days if you're like me and you live alone. We have plenty of silence, like it or not. But for others among you, silence can be in shorter supply than usual these days. It's impossible to hear Jesus if you have all this other noise going on in your life. Because he doesn't talk to us out loud, at least not, not usually, not in my experience. Instead, he speaks to our hearts. The only way you can hear him is by having a quiet time away from texting and technology, away from other voices. Choosing a specific time of day and a specific place are also keys to success. Second step that you can take is ask the Lord to help you hear. We have to want to hear the Lord in our lives. We have to want that enough to ask him to speak to us. The Lord respects our free will and autonomy. He wants to speak to us, but we have to ask him to actually hear him. We have to invite his voice into our lives. If we don't ask, we'll probably hear nothing. Ask the Lord to hear his voice. And if you don't know what else to pray for, make that your prayer. Third step. The key to hearing Jesus' voice is scripture. Scripture is the word of God. And anytime we spend time reading it, even reading it out loud, 
we are hearing the Lord. A good place to get started is the Gospels. The Gospels literally give us Jesus' own words, what he literally said to his friends and followers during his life. In your quiet time, take time, even if only a few minutes a day every day, to read through one of the Gospels. And pay attention to how Jesus addresses people. Imagine the tone of his voice. You really can learn to recognize his voice. Now I know, I know, I know, people will sometimes say to me, prayer doesn't work for me. It's a waste of time for me because God has nothing to say to, to me. It's, it's boring, I feel like I'm talking to myself, my mind wanders, I get it. I've had all of those experiences myself too. But keep at it. It takes time and effort to learn to recognize the voice of the Lord. It's like exercising once and then complaining that you didn't lose any weight. That doesn't work. Prayer is not set it and forget it. It's not once in a while or just when you're desperate. To be successful, to be fruitful, to be rich and enriching, to be enjoyable, it's like anything else. It requires time and effort. But it's worth the time and effort because he alone is the voice that we need to hear. Now, more than ever before, he alone is the voice that can confidently lead us into the successful future he wants for us.